Let us uh, open our Bibles and uh, let's uh, read the text that we are going to study for this afternoon service. Let's open to 1 Peter and then chapter 3 and verse 19. We have been looking at this letter of the Apostle Peter. And we are now in chapter 3 and reading from verse 18. And this is what is uh, said in this uh, passage. passage. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now we know that nowadays suffering due to COVID has become almost a common lot of all people. Now Tim Keller in his book, Pain and Suffering, had this to say, in the secular view, Suffering is never seen as a meaningful part of life, but only as an intru interruption. It's an interruption to uh, what is supposed to be a meaningful life. That is how they view suffering. But for the Christian, it's something that is so meaningful because without it, we will never understand the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we study the book of the, the epistle of Peter, we have been re, uh, talking about the sufferings of Christians, not, in the gener that, not the general sufferings that all men go through. It is the suffering of those who have been redeemed by Christ, a common lot of those with hope of eternal glory in Christ, those who consider suffering as those who consider suffering as a momentary pain while waiting for the suffering less condition in glory and we ask what is the motivation for accepting these lots as believers which God himself has ordained for Christians to go through this is not something that happened to us uh, just um, uh, no, um, just, it's just happened to us without any, any preparation or any plan. But we know that even our sufferings are part of God's plan for us. And what is that motivation that we can have to accept this lot which God himself ordained for us as Christians to go through? And in our text, we see here, Peter points them, the recipients of the letter, and us to the great example of suffering for the sake of righteousness. And it is no less the Lord Jesus Christ in the passage we have read. Archbishop Layton has this to say, God had one son without sin. He had none without suffering. So what uh, Leton is saying here, he has only one begotten son and he is without sin. But he has other sons, adopted sons in, in, his, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And including the Lord, he says, he says that he has none without suffering. No body of God's people are without suffering. We are going to go through this um, painful experience and here we see that peter seeks to encourage and strengthen suffering christians especially the recipients of this letter the the churches in uh, asia minor as we see this they are suffering for their faith during this time but also we find here that uh, it is not only them but all Christians, we are, be, we are being encouraged and strengthened in the face of suffering by making us look at Christ's own suffering. He draws our motivation to overcome all this suffering by pointing us and addressing to the vicarious substitutionary sacrifice of Christ for his people. As if Peter is saying here, look, see this. 
In the face of your suffering, look at Christ's suffering for you, for your good, for the salvation of your souls, in order to bring you to God. Now you will note here the connection when he says, for Christ or because Christ also suffered. Now some translation in the New King James Version it removes the word also. But it is crucial because it's in the original text. So it is saying, for Christ also, he is making this comparison. You are suffering as Christians for righteousness sake. And our Lord Jesus Christ is also, also suffered for righteousness sake, for doing what is good for you. And that is what he is saying here. While the suffering, suffering of Christ and Christians are similar in nature because we suffer for doing what is right or what is righteous, there is this similarity, this similarity or disparity we can see here. Because Christ's suffering is incomparable because his suffering is about his vicarious, his substitute, sacrifice he suffered in behalf of his people to bring them to glory that is the difference we suffer for righteousness sake for doing good but christ suffered as the substitute sacrifice for our sins in order to bring us to god that is the basic and fundamental fundamental difference of christ suffering with our suffering. So the message I would like to bring to you in this uh, passage is this. Our sufferings for righteousness is incomparable to the sufferings of Christ for our salvation. We should take comfort and encouragement in the face of suffering, in the sufferings of Christ for our salvation. So in order for us to understand the depth of Christ's suffering, we need to remind ourselves of the bankruptcy of our spiritual condition. We won't be able to appreciate the sufferings of Christ in, in becoming our substitute uh, for our sins if we are not going to, be remind, to remind ourselves of, about our own spiritual bankruptcy. And we, let's just review this for a while so that we can have better um, position to take up the sufferings of Christ. We have the problem of sin, death, and judgment. Because the Bible clearly says all have sinned. Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. All we, we are all sinners. We have gone astray. We have uh, strayed from God and we have become rebels. And so it is clear in the New Testament when we read Romans 3, 23, For we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we read that as well in Romans 3, 9 to 12. It tells us there is no good. No, not one. There is none righteous. There is none that can comprehend or understand God. There is none that seek after God because we are all sinners. And so in Romans 5, 12, therefore... Just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. You and I, every baby that is born into this world is a sinful creature because he had this original sin which he inherited from Adam. So we are all sinners by nature. Not only that we are all sinners, but we all have died because of our sins. Adam died on two counts. When he sinned, physical and spiritual, he, was, he died physically, we know that, but then he was separated from God. He died spiritually. 
And what do we read in Romans 6, 23? The wages of sin is death. It's not only physical death, but that separation from God, that is the wages of sin. When you work, you earn your wages. And because we work sin, the wages of our sin is death. Yun ang sweldo natin. Yun ang ating aanihin, yun ang ating makukuha. That is what we are going to receive. Death. Separation from our God. So Paul said in Romans 5, uh, 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 17, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, we all will die because we are all sinners. We are all separated from God because we all are sinners. But then more than physical death is the spiritual death which is separation from God. If man remains spiritually dead, he will suffer what is called the second death, eternal death. That death which is the eternal sufferings in the lake of fire. We read that in Romans 20, uh, Revelation 20, 14, 15. Revelations 21 and verse 8. That is the second judgment. For all those who remain spiritually dead, they would suffer the second death, that eternal separation of God away from God in that lake of fire which is called hell. Not only that we, are, we all have sinned when we all have died in Adam, but we are all condemned in Adam. And so we read again in Romans 5.18, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, one trespass led to condemnation of all men, we are all under God's judgment. You and I are all hell-bound sinners. So all are sinners with Adam, all died with Adam, all are under God's judgment with Adam. And that is our spiritual condition, our spiritual state. Now, the dilemma is this. How can God accept sinners who are worthy of His judgment? How can God leave the guilty and punish being the just God? How can He justify the ungodly? And this spiritual condition, the Bible is very clear, it cannot be remedied by our good work, by our own righteousness. It cannot be remedied by the church we belong to. The church cannot save us. Save us. Our baptism cannot save us from this spiritual condition. And that is what we see here. Um, our religion, our, even the faith of our parents cannot really... Uh, uh, Remedy our bankrupt spiritual condition before God. Now Peter answers that by what Christ has done as the suffering servant. The only way or means whereby man can escape sin, death, and judgment is through the sacrifice of the Son. Through the death of the Son. And so the Lord said Himself in Acts 4, 12, There is no other name whereby God has given to man in heaven and on earth, whereby man can be saved none. And we also read in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He removed all that man can think as a possibility whereby he can be saved. He says, none. It's only Christ as the only way to the Father. And so here Peter draws the answer through Christ's work of redemption at the cross and through his suffering for the salvation of his people. So let me just take this with you. And I have three points. I hope to, you know, I'm not, I'm not very much to pointer. I have three points in this passage. Here we have the suffering redeemer, the supreme example of suffering. And here is what Christ has had to suffer for our own salvation. Three things. We have the final sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
For Christ also suffered once and for all for our for sins. And then we have the vicarious sacrifice of Christ or the substitute sacrifice of Christ. We have the, the righteous for the unrighteous. And then the end goal of Christ's suffering is our reconciliation in order to bring us to God. Let's take the first point. I hope I will make this um, um, just uh, short. Let's take up the first one, the final sacrifice of God. For Christ also suffered once for sin, so once for all for our sin. The issue here is this. How can God deal with man's problem of sin, sin and guilt? And that is the issue here. And the answer, the Father sending the Son to suffer and die for the sins of His people. The answer is for the Son to become the sin bearer. Romans 8.32 He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? He did, who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all. It is the Father who did not spare His own Son. You know what that means. He could spare His own Son from this suffering, but no. Instead, what He did is to deliver Him up to this suffering. Galatians 4, 4, 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as son. Now you know what covenant uh, redemption is. We have there the covenant between the triune God. They planned the triune God. They planned the redemption of, his, of the elects. The Father will send the Son. The Son will accomplish the work of redemption and the Holy Spirit will apply that redemption. And this is what we see here, brethren. The death of Christ was not an afterthought. It was decreed that the Son should suffer for our sin. Do you see that point? It was not an accident that Christ was hung there, suffered for sins, it was actually the Father's will that the Son will suffer for the sins of His people. That is why when the Lord Jesus Christ cried at the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now there you see the depth of Christ's suffering. He could not even address His Father, Father. At that time, he can only address his father as God. And why? Because God has forsaken him. Because he is bearing the sins of his people. And God is not pleased that the son is bearing, carrying the sins of people. And it's not, it's not something that we can think that easy for the father to do. The son suffered for that. Yet the Father is bleeding as well in His own heart because he is, he is condemning His own Son because of the sins not His, but His people. And it tells us here, Paul, uh, Peter says, I uh, use the word once for all. Uh, the Greek word is hapax. That means unrepeatable. It's unique. It's definitive. It's final. His offering will no longer be repeated. It's final. It's there. Everything is settled at the once for all sacrifice of Christ at the cross. So we see here that Christ's suffering, which includes His death, of course, is obviously more than an example of suffering for God's people for doing good. Because it was the suffering of the no less the Son of God for the sins of His people. So we read in Galatians 2.24, He, 
uh, I mean, First Peter 2, in the passage that we have here in First Peter chapter 2 and then verse 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we have died to sin, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. When he was hung there on the cross, he bore our sins. In Romans 6.10, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And so the passage that we have in Hebrews 10, 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many once and once and for all, no longer will be repeat, repeated. Now we see here God already revealed the way of salvation that the triune God have decided in, the, in, uh, uh, in eternity. In the Old Testament, he revealed that way through types and shadows that there will be a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice for the sins of his people. But that cannot truly remove the sins of people. It's only a type and a shadow. They will have to repeat that year after year because it cannot truly remove sin. But unlike the Old Testament sacrifices here, Christ's suffering for sin does not need to be repeated. He has no need like those high priests, says Hebrews 7, 27, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself. And so we have in Hebrews 9, 26 as well, for then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world, but as it is. He has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He came, he appeared to this fallen world to put away sin by the sacrifice, by his once for all sacrifice. You know what the significance of that? Consider what Christ had to suffer by dying for our sins once for all. He suffered what anyone cannot imagine. He died for all the sins of his people. He did not die for one, for two, for three, but he died for all thousands of thousands of these people. He died for all their sins. He bore all of them at the cross. The sins of rebellion, the sins of lying, the sins of murder, the sins of immorality, slander, the sins of even of stealing and all sorts of sins. Christ bore all of it at the cross of Calvary in himself. He suffered for all of it. He suffered once for all. His suffering and death answers for all time our problem of sin. Do you see that significance? Because he died once for all, it is final. My sins, your sins, our sins before, our sins now, and our sins in the future are all there crucified in Christ because he bore all our sins at the cross of, of, of Calvary. So Isaiah 53, 4 to 6, The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All of us, all our iniquity, He has laid them all in the Lord Jesus Christ. So think about this. When Satan would bother you about your sin, telling you, look, you are not worthy to be uh, someone who claims to be saved by Christ's death, because look, you continue to sin. You have committed deed, you committed thus, you have lied, you have done this and that. What should you answer to Satan if he is bugging you with those kind of accusations? Just tell Satan, Satan, at the cross, all my sins have been paid for by my Savior, by my Redeemer. 
He took away all my sins. And He took away my death. And He took away my judgment. All of it, He took to Himself. And that is God's solution to man's problem of sin. And it took the Son to suffer and die for sins once for all. Christ took away the sins of His people, thereby taking away death and judgment. Brethren, consider your momentary afflictions for the sake of Christ. Hebrews 12, 4 said, You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. That is in the context, look at Christ, what He did at the cross. The perfecter and finisher of our faith. He died. He suffered and died. And yet, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Can you compare your sufferings to the sufferings of the dear Savior? No, you can't. Christ suffered to the uttermost because He suffered for all our sins. The thing that we cannot do he suffered to take away our sins. Let me just talk to you. If you are an unbeliever, you have no claim to Christ once for all sacrifice for sins if you are an unbeliever indeed. Now how then can you be saved from your sins, from God's, uh, from death, from condemnation? Here is the gospel appeal to you. Repent and believe the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. That's simple as that. The gospel is not something so hard to understand. The, 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 the gospel simply says, this simple thing that you must do, God is inviting you. Be saved by repenting and believing the Lord Jesus Christ. He is not asking you to do a lot of things before you can be saved. He is simply saying, bow down before Christ to be your Lord and your Savior. And so that is the first thing. Look at the sufferings, the suffering of Christ as our final sacrifice. And the second thing is that look at the vicarious sacrifice of Christ as the righteous for the unrighteous, the godly for the ungodly, the sinless for the sinful. Now here we have the issue. How can justify, how can God justify the sinner who is guilty? Sinner who is a guilty sinner. On what grounds Christ suffering for sins effective? That is the question here. How can, we, how, how can Christ, on what grounds can we say that Christ suffering indeed can remove our sins, can remove uh, the, the penalty of death and God's judgment? How can, what grounds, what authority does Christ have to die effectually for sinners? What? Now you know there the disparity, the stark contrasts. The righteous suffered and died. For whom? For the righteous? No, for the unrighteous. The sinless for the sinless as well? No, for the sinful. The godly for the ungodly? For the godly? No, it's for the God, ungodly. And this truth should break our heart. And my brother and sister, they should break your heart as well. What did Christ deserve to suffer such deep agony because of my sin, your sin, not his, not his sins? So we read in, in, in 1 Peter 2.22, quoting Isaiah 53.8, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And so we have Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are. Yet what? Without sin? He never sinned. He is perfectly sinless. And so when you read the great exchange passage in 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5 and then 21, For our sake, for you and me, my brother and sister. He made him who to be seen, who knew no sin. Christ the sinless. Christ the righteous. Christ who has never sinned. And yet, what did God do? He made him to be seen on our behalf. 
He made him the greatest sinner of all on our behalf. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. It's all that so that his perfect righteousness will become our righteousness. It is not our own righteousness because we can never be righteous before God. But we are counted as righteous because of the righteousness of Christ. You know what this means? It takes a perfectly sinless man to be our Redeemer. That's the point. What is the ground? Why Christ suffering for, once for all suffering for our sin is effective. Is effect one. It is because He is the perfect sacrifice. The sinless sacrifice. Because it takes a perfectly sinless man to be our Redeemer. The only way we could be declared not guilty for any sin before God is to have the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the reason Christ's death is sufficient is precisely because he was sinless. He could have not died on behalf of his people if he himself was stained even with just a single or small sin. He cannot. It takes a perfectly sinless man to be uh, to die for us. His perfect obedience, therefore, is the basis for the sufficiency of his death. Now, we just consider all these passages. Romans 5, 6 to 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. We are weak, we are sinners, but at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, what would dare even to die? But God, look at this, shows His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The righteous, the sinless, died for the unrighteous, for the sinful. That is what we see, and that is the wonder of God's love. He died for unworthy, guilty sinners. And this is what we find here. <coughs> the reason Paul declared of himself, Christ Jesus came into the world, to save sinners of whom I am chief. If you understand, like Paul, what it means for the Savior to suffer for our sins, you would only see yourself as the chief of all sinners. I don't care if you grew up in a Christian family. You are a good person. But if you happen to see what the perfect righteousness of Christ when he died on that cross of Calvary, you can only see your sinful self, your wretchedness. That's why Paul says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Consider your present suffering again. You deserve, you know, you deserve all of it because you are a guilty sinner. There is no suffering that we go through in this life which we do not deserve. And you know what? We ultimately deserve hell. We are all going there. That is our destiny. We are all hell-bound sinners. And tell me, is that, is that something unusual? No. Because that is what we deserve as sinners. But here, Christ suffered. Something he does not deserve because he is sinless. Do you see that point? He does not deserve to suffer for sins because he is sinless. He is perfectly righteous. How can a sinless Redeemer suffer for, for a sinner? Say, like me. You know what Calvin said? When I, whenever I stand at the foot of the cross, I wonder why I am saved at all. You can simply gaze at the cross of Christ. His death on that cross 
and then you will see. I wonder why I am saved at all. I do not deserve anything of that. My dear Savior, who is sinless, died for me. And you will most appreciate the substitutionary death of Christ. When you consider the cost that was paid, it is from the blood of the perfectly righteous Redeemer. And look at who are those who are redeemed and saved, the worthless sinners like you and like me. When you see that big disparity, you will appreciate what Christ had to suffer for you. And then finally, we have the end goal or the purpose of Christ's suffering here by dying on the cross, the righteous to the un for the unrighteous is reconciliation that he might bring us to God. Now, the play of word ng atonement, at one man, that means two parties are being made one. Two opposing parties are being made one, that is, at one man, play of words. Because atonement is reconciliation. That is the end goal of atonement, to reconcile sinners who have been separated from God. So the whole process of atonement is reconciliation. So he suffered and died for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring us to God. That is what we have here. He suffered once for all for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And so when we read Ephesians and then chapter 2, we read 11 to 18. This is a long passage, but I want you to review this. Let me just read this to you. And just consider meditating then again when you go home. And so what we read in Ephesians 2, 11 to 18, Therefore, remember that you, talking to, uh, to believers when they were still unconverted, that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the, uh, the circumcision made in the, made in the flesh by hands, and at that time, you were without Christ. That is your uh, um, condition before, without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And here is the key word here. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We are now reconciled to God. And if you read until verse 18, that is the context there. It's about Christ's blood that brought us near to God, that reconciled us, that made peace between sinner and the holy God. And this, that is the end of the atonement sacrifice of Christ to reconcile us to God, to uh, once again restore that broken fellowship with God, to bridge that separation because of sin. He now has bridged that separation because of Christ's death. You are now brought near. And now you have an access to God. You can now uh, go to God because He has opened the new and the living way by His blood. Now, Tim Keller has this to say in his book again, Pain and Suffering. Jesus lost all His glory so that we could be clothed in His glory. First, He was shut out so we could get access to God. He was bound. He was nailed so that we could be free. He was cast out so we could approach 
And Jesus took away the only kind of suffering that can really destroy you. He is referring about the eternal suffering of a person without Christ. That's really the, what we may call the final destruction of people outside of Christ. And then that is being cast away from God. He took that so that now all suffering that comes into your life will only make you great. A lamp of coal under pressure becomes a diamond. And the suffering of a person in Christ only turns you into somebody gorgeous. So look at your suffering. Tim Keller is saying here. You know what Christ did? By dying on the cross once for all, it took away what you are supposed to suffer in eternity, cast away forever from God. He took that. He suffered so that He can take that away from you. He took that to Himself when He suffered so that you now can be bold and confident can, and you can say that when I get to heaven, I am free from all suffering because Christ already suffered for me. Do you get that point? He suffered so, uh, so deeply, so intensely. He suffered actually hell so that He can take away your hell, my brother and my sister. Yet Peter does not leave that without telling his readers, how is that possible? How is that possible? It is because he put to death in the flesh, but he was made alive in the spirit. In other words, the validity of Christ's reconciliatory work, his atonement sacrifice, is his resurrection. Christ rose from the dead. He was made, he died in the flesh, he made alive in the spirit. He was risen from the dead. How can you be assured that what Christ did for you is something that is sure, that is certain? Because Christ rose from the dead. He was made alive by the Spirit. God's stamp of approval is by raising His Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. All the work of Christ at the cross is sealed with God's approval. His sacrifice, God was pleased to accept it that it can truly cleanse the sins of His people, that it can truly take away the wages of sin that is there, that it can truly take away the, the judgment of His people because Christ rose from the dead. And He also, because He rose from the dead, He has already taken away that eternal suffering that awaits us. There is now no more condemnation for those who are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because He died for us, for all our sin. It took away your condemnation. It took away your suffering. And now you are not facing as a condemned sinner at the judgment seat of Christ. If Christ is not risen, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, is vain, and you are still in your sins. You know what the argument of Apostle Paul there? You, look, here is the doctrine of Christ's resurrection. You must take it, you must believe it because it happened in history. Because if Christ did not rise from the dead, your faith is in vain, it's futile, it's meaningless. And because he did not rise from the dead, you are still in your sin. There is no proof that your sins have been washed by the blood of Christ because he has not risen from the dead. So then consider Jesus who suffered for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous in order to bring us to God, to have access with God. He took the kind of suffering, hell-bound suffering, in order to take it away from us. Now, 
whatever suffering we go through, remember, we are already freed from that eternal suffering. So even if, no matter how severe you're suffering now, if you are a Christian, this is the comfort that you have. Because you are no longer going to face that eternal suffering. That when you get to heaven, you will be you will be here you will be having a sufferingless life with God forever. And then the now it's a book of Revelation. It will take away all our pains. There will be no more crying. And it will take away all our sins. Even death, it will take that away when we get there. Consider now again your suffering, the sufferings of Christ. He took your suffering to escape the eternal suffering which all men deserve. We sang 2, 3, 5. Sometimes we hardly, we find it hard to really take all of this in, in our minds and in our hearts. So the hymn says, Oh, make me understand it. Help me to take it in. What it meant to thee, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. May that be our prayer and prayer always. Make me understand. This finite mind cannot simply comprehend fully the sufferings of Christ for my salvation. So help me to take it in. What it meant to thee, the Holy One to bear away my sin. Again, Tim Keller from the promise book, Pain and Suffering, said, you don't really know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. You know what uh, Tim Keller is saying there? Is that suffering makes us see that Jesus is all, is all we need. And whatever is taken away from us, even our own life, if Jesus is with us, that is all that we need to have and we need to know. You don't really know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all that you have. Sometimes that is the message of suffering for all of us. We suffer for us so that we can understand that all that we need is Christ. You know, sometimes you forget that. And so when our life is just going well, uh, we never think of what Christ has done for us. We never think of the sufficiency of Christ. But when we are hit with something that would make us suffer, like the Apostle Paul, he saw his sufficiency is in Christ. It is in the grace of God alone, not in himself. It is what he needs. Now, see Fernando Ortega, guys, one of my favorite singers, of course. He has a song, In the Morning When I Rise. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. Take away everything, but give me Jesus. That's all that we need, my brethren. You see, suffering will be unbearable if you aren't certain that God is for you and with you. So brethren, this should remind all of us, unless you are certain that Christ indeed died for your sins, the sinless for the sinful, and now reconciled you with God. If that is not something very clear to you, your suffering will be unbearable. But this is clear to you that you can say that indeed Christ died for me, he took away all my sins. And now he has reconciled me to God because he rose from the dead. And any kind of suffering that will be bearable to you. May we all have Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our own Redeemer. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you once again for the great truth of what Christ had to suffer for our salvation. We don't deserve anything of it, our God. 
We are sinful. We are rebellious. And yet, when we gaze at the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, what He had to suffer to take away our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. We are simply brought to our knees and confess, Woe is me, for I do not deserve anything, yet thank you, my God, because by your grace, you had made me understand what it meant to be the Holy One to bear away my sins. So God, we do pray for each one of us that we will always be reminded in times of suffering like these difficult times because of the pandemic. Take away anything from us, but leave Jesus. Give Jesus to us. That is all that we need. He is all that we need. And so if we are friends who still are not uh, uh, saved, they have not yet... uh, repented and believed the Lord Jesus Christ, they have not confessed Christ to be their own Lord and Savior. May you have mercy upon them. See their dire need of Christ. See what awaits them, eternal suffering in hell. If Christ is not their own Savior who suffered the eternal suffering of sin, due because of sin, in order to save his people from that suffering in hell. So we thank you again for all this. May we take everything in our hearts and be and come out as a more uh, loving, serving people, Lord, to you. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.